the first thing I want to explain in this page is simply how Russia would react to this. Because they want mechanisms like, oh, Russia will be pretty pissed off that they invested this into you and they can no longer use you. But we would in fact say that the strategic calculus for Russia is far in favour of them not abolishing the weapon group, continuing to use it in its operations elsewhere. This is a sort of preferable outcome for both the weapon group and Russia will be extremely happy to do this. That is obviously a situation where the weapon group uh, is very far ahead. Firstly, it is just that Russia, first reason uh, that this is the case is simply because Russia does gain nothing from abolishing you to the extent that, as opposition points out, they have invested a lot in you. They are like, I have allowed you to do this training for a long time. That is pretty, like, presumably something that they would want to continue to benefit from in the long term. There is no real benefit from up. Uh, and opposition you know, couldn't really point to a benefit for all of Russia, in fact, up uh, engaging this group other than they would be annoyed by it. But within Zach's way, it is literally quite good for Russia to continue having the Valmu group uh, continue its sort of overseas operations. For example, pursuing Russian interests in Syria or in Sudan, as it has currently been doing, and as it has been expanding and increasing in success, while the sort of mainstream <coughs> Russian army, uh, the regular Russian army, fights the war in Ukraine. That's firstly because it is just more efficient for the highly mobile Valmu group to be deployed in the overseas scenarios, and that is a scenario where it can get the like, sort of greatest benefit, because that is specifically the thing that it is best at doing. And given the Valmu group is quite small, uh, it is easily, like, off, easily possible for the Roman group to find, for example, things for its 50,000 troops to do in places like Sudan and Syria, which conform with Russian interests. And this is obviously something that Russia will do, uh, because although they are obviously fighting the war in Ukraine, they obviously have not abandoned their interests in the rest of the world for the fact that that is, A, ideologically not something they want to do, but uh, because Russia still has its grand business sort of maintaining its status as a world power, but obviously also its interests elsewhere, so for example, protecting its supply for, of, like, for example, oil, uh, is something that is necessary to continuing to fight the war in Ukraine. So that obviously they have some sort of troops elsewhere, the likely counterfactual in this debate is just that is the the Valmu group, that is a much better outcome uh, for the Valmu group. Uh, and obviously that means that you still do get support from the Russian, uh, Russian government and they will just not abolish you. But secondly, we would just say uh, uh, it is quite uh, unstrategic for Putin to own the Russian group. Uh, firstly, because a lot of the time these are just his like, uh, allies and friends. Uh, and the oligarchs have been the ones who have invested heavily in the Russian group and who have benefited heavily from it. And I would note that those oligarchs are the ones who are necessary to maintain Putin's power. And what that explains is, again, an active uh, loss for Russia to uh, abolish the, uh, the Valmu group, as they say, it's obviously much more beneficial to have them continue to operate elsewhere. But thirdly, which is quite interesting, probably going to be likely unpopular within, within Russia for them to do so. Firstly, because it does just look like you being like, particularly targeting uh, a group of Russian citizens who are continuing what, to want to like, take duty for Russia elsewhere. Uh, but also, especially when there are other people in Russia who are not super supportive of the war, or who are initially supportive uh, or, or or, or, you know, view the war as a losing effort, in which case they would be like, oh, maybe the Wagner group was right all along. What this explains is that the, their very worst harms about Russia owning the Wagner group are quite implausible. And in fact, uh, contrarily, Russia uh, would like, be quite happy to have the Wagner group still sort of, like, uh, go and support its interests elsewhere and carry out its interests elsewhere. That is obviously a situation uh, that it, it, we would say that is the likely counterfactual, and that is one where uh, a lot of their harms no longer exist. Uh, and what you need to contrast that to, because even if you believe, like, okay, Russia will be angry, uh, at least this explains that Russia is not going to entirely abolish the group and that Russia can find uh, uses for the group elsewhere. Uh, we tell you that the, uh, what is currently going to happen to the group in fighting the war is just it will cease to exist because the Russia is going to lose the war. Russia is never going to win this war. There is literally not a viable future for the Wagner group uh, in, in, in their world. And they were like, hugely responsive to a lot of real material here because they were just like, well, the the fact that the uh, the Wagner group, you know, is sort of a Russian nationalist group means that they wouldn't care. But obviously, you do still care when you are losing all of your profits. A because that does just make your life more uncomfortable if you are either, but if you are the leaders of the Wagner group, you still need an income stream of some sort. But secondly, part of your group has just died. I don't care how much of a Russian nationalist you are when the people around you, when you are literally using losing like key commanders in these groups because they've obviously had to fight on the battlefield. That is obviously something you care about. They simply cannot just explain that away by characterizing this group as part of Russia, because obviously this is still something that would be regrettable. Uh, but obviously, secondly, we would just say uh, a lot of this is sort of contingent on, a lot of their sort of benefits here are contingent in the long-term outcome being particularly good for the Wagner group. But it's quite obvious that Russia is simply going to lose this war. We point empirically the fact that Russia is currently failing 
The fact that the West is currently increasing its support and increasing the send arms to Ukraine, and the fact that the atrocities that Russia have committed have been particularly public. We point to the incident with the dam recently, and we just point to the fact that the long term future for this war just never makes sense to Russia. They simply can, never can annex Ukraine. And the point of this is just to say uh, they're going to continue losing the war, they're going to continue having to dump more and more of their troops into this war. It is far too late to pill up. Pull out, but you're also going to be more targeted. Uh, this is clearly something uh, which is just up. Uh, uh, and obviously, the reason you can't change your mind now is because you've only caught both harms because you've not caught all of the harms of pulling out of the war. But also, now Russia, uh, you know, is mad at you for all the reasons that they say. Even more so because it was uh, seen as sort of unforeseen and, and it is more damaging to Russia in this way. What this explains to you uh, is that the comparative in this debate is under one side, you are continuing to exist, you are deployed to sort of Russian operations elsewhere, as we point out to you from first, in places like Syria and Sudan. That is obviously something that uh, would be strategic for Russia to do. And by fighting the Russian war, you lose all of your troops, you lose all of your arms. That is particularly damaging. Uh, the next thing to just explain is that, yeah, obviously, uh, the next thing to explain is in the particularly long term future, uh, it's is, it is just simply like uh, not that uh, profitable for you, or not that uh, beneficial for you to continue relying on Russia. Uh, first of all, it's just quite like Russia's support is not as, as important to this group as opposition say. Obviously, you do have your own sort of independent streams of profit at the point at which you are still operating in other areas. And in the scenario in which you decide not to do the war, and Russia does decide to like try to own you as that said, there are obviously pretty easy steps the group can take to, uh, to like alternate uh, to other sorts of things. For example, I don't know, just continue like procuring contracts directly with the Syrian and uh, Syrian government and the, Sudan, and the Sudanese group that you have been working for and just cutting out uh, Russia. But also it's like you still just do have troops, you still have resources, you still have control of places like oil fields elsewhere. You do have a lot of leverage and a lot of uh, capacity to gain arms from other sources. Russia is obviously not the only, uh, only, only source that you can. Uh, it's obviously not as devastating as they say uh, for this group. But I just will, will point out in the long term uh, that in the scenario where Russia loses this war, you do just cease to exist. You do have, cease to have someone who is uh, able to pay to you, or, in, or uh, able to like, pay you and continue to support your group. Or even in the scenario uh, where, where, where they do like the war ends, Russia is now just very weak. Russia is just now very broke. That is obviously a massive harm for you and something uh, that is just much worse because the future of the group isn't that you are continuing to get like the best Russian arms. It's now the Russian military is particularly depleted. And we'd say uh, the scenario uh, that is much more preferable for you is where you continue to protect Russian interests elsewhere. And the reason for that is at the point at which the rest of the Russian military has been devastated in Ukraine, you are now a particularly important resource to Russia in our kind of battle, which gives the Wagner group uh, much more leverage and much more ability to sort of gain power and, 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 and you know, support uh, its interests in other ways. At the end of this speech, you know that there is an obviously viable future uh, for this group that is in fact preferable when you do not support the war and you do not engage in the war. But secondly, when you do engage in the war, you get owned, you lose all of your troops and you're forced to continue sending your troops into a battle where you see them die, you see your weapons be lost, you uh, live a life where you can never travel to another uh, nation because you were involved in the war, you get owned by CIA, CIA drone strikes in Syria. Uh, this is obviously not preferable, very, very proud of you. Sidenegative wins this debate pretty handily for two independent reasons. The first is that you just gain tons of power on side negative. The second is that you lose tons of power on side affirmative. Let's talk about the power we gain by going to war. We explain a set of very obvious empirical facts, which the average intelligent voter who reads the news knows, that the Ukraine war has been power expanding for the Wagner group. It has entrenched the Wagner group as part of the Russian military, as part of Russia's national patriotic brand. It's given it legal privileges, the privilege to, for instance, conscript prisoners as part of its foot soldiers. It's given it a huge amount of money and weapons that it has not had before. It has emboldened vocal members and important members of the Wagner group, like Yevgeny Grozin, who has been able to vocally criticize, for instance, Defense Minister, that indicates he's pretty comfortable with his power within the regime. It has become a company in 2022 for the first time. It has privileges it has not had before. What do they say to get around this? Tide affirmative has three pushes. The first claim they make is, well, you're losing stuff because there's an opportunity cost. You otherwise could get contracted by other countries, which is an unbelievable argument for two reasons. Firstly, it's just would have never happened. Number one, because the Wagner Group 
is only used by Russia. It is, exists as an arm of the state. And I would note that many of the benefits the affirmative team points to, like getting diamond mines in the Central African Republic, like getting access to oil fields in Libya, yeah, the Wagner Group has access to those things through contracts with the Russian government. It works on behalf of Russia in the Central African Republic, on behalf of Russia in Mali, on behalf of Russia in Syria. It is only because of those contracts that it gets those national resources. But secondly, they fail to prove a tipping point. Why on earth would any other country in the world, most of whom are deeply ideologically opposed to Russia, who have relationships with their own PMCs, use the Wagner Group rather than Academy, rather than G4S, rather than NBRI, rather than Aegis Defense Force, rather than KBR, or any of the other many PMCs and paramilitary groups that exist across the world who you trust more, you have pre-existing military and weapons relationships with, and who are not currently engaged in military operations against you or against countries you are allied with. That is literally ridiculous. But the second reason this argument falls down is that it is totally undesirable for the Wagner Group to have contracts with other states, for the reason that, as we know at Daniel, they just misunderstand the Wagner Group's desires. They're not primarily profit motivated. They are an arm of the state. They care about Russia's interests. It would be deeply against their interests to work, for instance, at the US. But secondly, you get no money from the other contracts they're describing. Like, they're saying, well, it would be awesome if you just, like, did more of what you do in Mali and control governments there. That is deeply unprofitable for the Wagner Group. You get maybe, like, $10 million from the junta. You have to control nations, which is pretty hard to do for a company, and also does put your soldiers in danger. We think what you vastly prefer as a company is to send your soldiers to war <coughs> rather than control governments, which is pretty difficult, pretty dangerous, and pretty expensive. Clearly, you lose tons of power. That push was totally out of the debate. It was ridiculous from the beginning. The second push they give is, well, Russia's going to lose the war anyway. Uh, firstly, who cares? Like, it's still better to go out fighting. Russia wants to fight. You're an arm of the state. It has strong interest to go to war. That is its revealed preference. Even if it loses it, it's still good to be there. But secondly, even if Russia loses the war, it still exists afterwards just in a weaker capacity. So it's very important to have entrenched yourself as an arm of the state even further after the war is over. But thirdly, even in their worst case, if Russia is like literally destroyed and doesn't have the capacity to say fund the military or give you money anymore later, it's better that happens five years from now rather than one year from now, and the Wagner Group's military efforts stave off Russia's decline, so it's very, very important. But finally, I heard in response to second affirmative that you just gain a huge amount of power because you are displaying the value you're adding to the Russian state, even going to war. You're part of the national brand. You explain that you are better than the other military forces that you're competing with, or better than the national military. So even if Russia loses, it's far better that we are in that fight. The final push they give is, well, your workforce or soldiers are really angry, so they're going to defect to other PMCs. And there are like analytical gaps at literally every level of this argument. It's insane. Uh, firstly, people aren't angry. People are pretty happy to be fighting in the Ukraine war because people feel that that is incredibly patriotically important for them. They're fighting at home. It's way preferable to be fighting in, uh, as in Ukraine than it is to be in Mali or be in the Central African Republic because you're on your home turf. You're with people you know. You're not removed from your own country. Uh, also, just the group has more power, more money. There's a substantially better quality of life for the average contractor working for you. But secondly, you don't care about your people's interests other than maybe they work less well for you. So I just want to know if you're a company, you don't care about the quality of life of people who work for you. But thirdly, these people cannot affect. Often you're hiring foot soldiers who are conscripted from prisons who do not have other employment opportunities, or you're dealing with very powerful henchmen who are close to the Russian regime and are obviously not going to be working with other potential PMC contractors. So that is out of the debate. You gain an enormous amount of power by going to war. Uh, this is very simple, right? The Ukraine war has been very, very good for the Wagner group. It's odd this motion was set because the facts pretty neatly align with side negative. It has been good for its interests. Let's look then secondly at the other way we win, which is explaining that you just lose a ton of power and affirmative by declining to do what Russia wants. And the structure of this argument from side negative is very simple. It is the Wagner group is an arm of the Russian state. Russia wants to go to war and fight it hard, even if that might be irrational. And if the Wagner group declines doing so, it risks huge amounts of punishment. We get a series of mitigation from this affirmative team that even if you believe all of it, would never crack into even like the 50% of our argument mark. Like it would still win us the debate on its own, I think. Well, maybe not, but I just think the argument itself is pretty powerful, which is that you would be disbanded, you'd have your resources reappropriated, you'd lose your power or your size. What mitigation do they give? The first thing they say is, well, Russia's not going to respond like that because it would really anger oligarchs. But it's unclear why that is the case, right? Like, oligarchs largely support the government. They're friends with Russia by their own analysis with Putin and other people who are higher up. So it's unclear that disbanding the Wagner group will piss them off so much that they would probably go against their own safety interests of speaking out against the Russian government or opposing you that it would piss off as many, 
in as substantial a number in order to get that impact, those people are subservient to Putin. And yes, oligarchs who control or are related to the Wagner group want to have power over other generals in the army or other arms of the Russian state, but they probably can't and don't want to overpower Putin. Secondly, they say, well, Russia benefits from the Wagner group, so it won't expand it. Obviously, it would also benefit from reappropriating the troops that are given to the Wagner group and instead using it in the national military if the Wagner group turns out to be such a pesky problem because they're not going to war, which is literally the thing you want them to do. But secondly, note that our arms are not only that the Wagner group would be disbanded. Even if that doesn't happen, you also just give it less money. You remove the privileges that it has now to conscript whoever it wants. All of those things go away on the side of affirmative. The next thing they say is, well, government's backlash would expose the Wagner Group's existence, which is a very silly claim. People broadly know that the Wagner Group exists. Russia doesn't really care. And note that that is not intention without claim about plausible deniability, because where the Russian government wants to crack down on individual contractors for the Wagner Group, you can still say, hang on, you're illegal, we're going to disappear you. But it understands that people broadly in the international community know that it exists, so that doesn't get a harm. The final thing then they say is, well, you can help Russia in other ways, for instance, provide private security. But I would note, one, that kind of is a bit of a definitional problem that I think providing private security such that you're able to go to war sort of is participating in war. Maybe that's not true, but like I think it kind of is. Even if it's not, it's just unimportant, right? Like the Wagner Group's expertise and specialization is troops and military support. Providing private security is woefully insufficient given the needs of the Russian government. But I would note thirdly, that means they just concede a bunch of their benefits about men that would otherwise be taken to Mali or the Central African Republic or wherever to fight those other battles. So it's incredibly unclear that that is a benefit. In every way, I think this is a very clear win for side negative. It's pretty hard affirmative motion, so like fair enough. <laughs>
uh, PNC could never do it on its own. They always require a backup, which explains why on their side, you just immediately delete it as soon as you try not going to Ukraine, which means the debate just ends right there. This team gives you six responses. I've got plenty of time. Let's go through them. Firstly, they say, well, being banned would be bad because it exposes that you're just an armed Russian government. Firstly, everyone knows you're an arm of the Russian government, unclear what the harm of this is. Secondly, this doesn't make sense. Why would it expose that? Like, every time a government bans a thing in its country, that doesn't imply that the thing must have been part of the government in that country. It's called regulation. It occurs relatively frequently. Secondly, they say you are close movement of influence. Firstly, we would suggest that influence is probably contingent on doing things Putin wants you to do, and that as soon as you stop doing things Putin wants you to do, that influence would have a habit of disappearing overnight. But secondly, could this team provide a single example of somebody who's gone toe to toe with Putin and just been like, don't feel like that, mate, and then come out alive at the end of it? Probably not. Thirdly, they say, well, you could justify this policy because you're helping Russian allies, which is an important contribution to the Russian war effort. Like, it's probably true that you could make that argument, but it's also obviously true that Putin cares far more about winning in Ukraine than he cares about, like, maybe having some allies for life in war, which is a long term payoff, while the threat in Ukraine is one, far more important because it's existential threat to Russia, and two, far more urgent because you need the troops right now while you can obviously just help those allies at a later point in time, which explains why this doesn't weigh up uh, at all. Fourthly, they say you have nothing to gain from abolishing the Wagner group, and in fact they'll fight back, so it'd be disastrous. You'd have to go into huge conflict with 50,000 troops. Firstly, obviously there's a lot to gain. You take their weapons, you conscript the troops, you send them into the meat grinder at the front of the lines. But secondly, no, they wouldn't fight back. The vast majority of people who work for the Wagner group are conscripts taken from prisons. They have no incentive to want to you know, die fighting the Russian military. They'd obviously just surrender at the immediate point it's possible. Secondly, the other members of the Wagner group who actually lead it tend to be ultra-nationalist Russians who believe in the cause of Russia, who want to fight in Ukraine, who want to see the country succeed. There is no world in which they fight against country's own military, but thirdly, even just on consideration of logic, obviously the Wagner group knows it would never win against the Russian army, so they would surrender rather than fight and gain immediate death. That just doesn't make sense from this team. Fifthly, they say it would be deeply unpopular, so you wouldn't do it. No explanation as to who the Wagner group would be popular with in a world in which the Russian government decides to clamp down on it. Like, the people who like PNCs are generally ultra-nationalists. At the point in time where the government goes against them, they cease to like that particular group, particularly when the reason the group is being cracked down on is that they're cowardly refusing to fight in that country's existential conflict in Ukraine. But lastly, they say, well, you're dead either way, so why does it matter? Like, you'll probably just die in Ukraine and it'll all be terrible. Three reasons this doesn't work. Firstly, they have a problem of time scale. You die immediately on our side, on their side, maybe you lose the war in Ukraine and die 5, 10, 15 years later, whenever that conflict ends, very substantially different. Secondly, in our worst case, Russia still exists even if it loses the war in Ukraine, right? Like, Russia would just have to give back Ukrainian territory. You would still exist in Russia as a PMC. Maybe you lose some troops, you're a company. You don't care about that. You gain influence, which is infinitely valuable to you. That was worthwhile. But it's also possible you just win the war in Ukraine. Trump comes to power in 2024. He doesn't particularly care about assisting Ukraine. It's very plausible that Russia does have a pathway to victory. This team does no work to establish why Ukraine was a lost cause for Russia. It was lazy analysis on their part. The conclusion of this argument is literally all of their responses, which really didn't need to be dealt with, have been dealt with, they're definitively out of the debate on the clearest pathway to victory, which is why we take the debate by about 10 points on that issue. Let's move on to issue two, which deals with the most possible generous version of their case, which is to engage with all the reasons why, if you did believe the counterfactual was you got to go have a holiday in Mali, why that still wouldn't be preferable to the benefits that we provide for you. There were four key benefits we were able to identify. Firstly, you got substantially more money by fighting Ukraine. Why? Because Russia's on a wartime footing, it has far more money to give out, and a lot of that money will go to you as a Wagner group because you're leading the charge in Ukraine, which means that you become substantially more powerful. Secondly, you have access to things like elite units and soldiers as a result. We explain the mechanism for this is that the Russian army has limited capacity to pay people above market rates because military pay scales tend to be locked in, but the private companies can attract commandos and other specialized units by paying substantially more amounts of money, which is why the best Russian soldiers have ended up as part of the Wagner group rather than as part of the regular Russian army, which also increases your importance to the Russian army because you're now the people who do the most specialized operations and are required to lead the tip of the spear, which also explains why you likely to have better weapons, better intelligence, access to a variety of additional tools that make you invaluable and far more useful. And lastly, we explain that it's given infinite amounts of prestige and power to the Wagner group. 
because Russian army spent four months besieging the town of Bakhmut in Ukraine, then Yevgeny Prigozhin led the troops in himself from the Vega group and took the town and made him a Russian war hero. That means that you are far more powerful. It makes you Putin's right hand man. Their only response on the comparative is to say, well, being in Mali would be easier and more profitable. Three problems. Firstly, we explained you don't care about profit. One, like, what are you going to spend it on? Russia's under sanction. You're already an oligarch, so your quality of life is already good. What does the money get you? No explanation. Secondly, we explain that the contracts aren't in and of themselves profitable. They've just been in, like benefiting Russian foreign policy. You haven't earned money out of it. The Russian government has lost money in order to buy prestige, in order to buy friends abroad. But finally, it's unclear it is easier, right? Like fighting jihadists in the Sahel is dangerous work. These are fundamentalists. They're often willing to engage in suicide bombing. Many reasons to believe more people would die in that conflict at the end. Look. We get influence on our side, which is infinitely more valuable. They have no pathway to benefit if you went to Mali. At the end of the day, the dog that fights its master is inevitably put down. Choose to live.